going to start momentarily. All right, <coughs> we're underway now, excuse me. <coughs> All right, um, let's see, chapter three. Now, yeah, we're going to start that now. And to start chapter three, we're going to start uh, reviewing a little bit about the mole. Okay. Okay, we'll say the mole. And uh, in fact, I'm going to kind of condense some things here and say the mole and related calculations. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, now I also want to point out something about this chapter. I do like this book, but chapter three always kind of bugs me a bit. The order of the topics. Uh, maybe he had a very good reason for doing it. I haven't talked to the author, but um, I kind of like to do it a little bit differently. So what I'll do is as I go through this, I'll kind of alert you where in the chapter. You'll get all the material in, but he does some things a little bit too early, at least in my opinion. So anyway, I'd, stay, I'd say stick closely to my notes for this chapter. Uh, read the chapter, but kind of like use my notes as a primary source, Okay. And then go to the chapter for your backup and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he does one version of calculations in here. <coughs> he uses something called an ice table, which you will use a lot in equilibrium next semester. But I, I don't think it's really that necessary for what we're going to be doing in this chapter. And I think, it's, it, I think it can kind of confuse students. So I'm going to show you a little more straightforward way of doing things. Okay? So anyway, the mole and its related calculation. Okay, one mole, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, whatever. <coughs> okay, we talked about the mole a little bit when we were talking about um, uh, units of measurement. And uh, remember I talked to you guys about a mole is an appropriate unit of counting for these very small particles that we call atoms and molecules. Okay, it's very appropriate for that. Just like, as I said, a light year is a very appropriate unit of distance when you're talking about distances between stars, galaxies, what have you, okay? To use uh, miles and kilometers to talk about the distance between stars would be very cumbersome. To use light years is much more useful. <coughs> By the same token, the, as I told you, the uh, distance between here and Columbus, it would be totally inappropriate to use uh, light years to measure those. We use miles or kilometers, okay? So this is an incredibly big number. And I think I, did I mention to you guys about like if you had just a, a, a glass full of water, something like a, like a large wine glass or something, uh, there's more atoms in there than there are stars in the universe. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you the calculation sometime. But uh, for these tiny, tiny particles, you need a vast number of them to basically work with them in laboratories and such, okay? Now, in the book, they just simply say a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and that's to four significant figures, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Let's see. I already covered all that stuff with you. Let's talk about um, the relationship of the mole to the AMU. Now, I remember telling you that on the periodic table, and not this one, because they don't have it, but if you look at the mass, the uh, atomic mass on it, okay, uh, it doesn't have any units. And I told you you could use AMUs or grams per mole. And I'd just like to give you an example of how that works. It'll just take about a, about a minute worth of calculation. Uh, the relationship of uh, one AMU is equal to six point, ah, always forget. I always get these two numbers mixed up. 66054. Yeah. Six. I, I knew I'd get it wrong on Monday morning. 66054 times 10 to minus 33 grams. <coughs> okay? So you can imagine if we just worked with grams and we're talking about the mass of individual atoms, how cumbersome that would be. So anyway, let's uh, move over this way just a little bit. And I'll give you guys time to... Look at that for a second. If you're looking at it on the video, oh, by the way, uh, here goes my thing here. Uh, I was told in an email on Friday that Tegrity does not do real time. 
And then I got an email over the weekend from the Tegarty people saying, oops, our mistake, we can't. And I did all the connections and switches, and then I asked them, do I have to do this for every lecture? And then they came back and said, we'll keep you in touch. So hopefully today they'll get back to me. I can send you an email. So if it's up and running, I don't want anybody right now to stay home to think they can watch the lecture if it's not going to work. But uh, anyway, I'm working on it. We'll get it. All right, so let's say we take a carbon atom. And it has a relative mass of 12.011 atomic mass units. Okay. Now, first of all, let's convert that. You guys do this, too, just as an exercise. Get out your calculators, okay? <coughs> Get the uh, proper uh, um, conversion factor. And let's uh, convert this into actual grams. Okay? It'll be 1 AMU. 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 34 grams. So you see the AMUs are going to cancel out, so we're going to be left with uh, grams. So you guys do that real quick. I'll have a cup of coffee, and now I'll do it too. Okay, so we got 12.011 times 1.66054. 054 minus 34. Okay, now from this what I get is 1.99447. I think that's enough significant figures. Uh, well, actually, we've only got four here, so I'm going beyond. Uh, let's see, times 10 to the minus. Oh, wait a minute, I missed something here. The first number is correct, the second one should be. Let me take that over again. Yeah. I know. I just want to see where I made my mistake. Okay. We got that. We got that. Uh, times 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 34. Huh. Anyway, you said you got what? 20 what? 33, yeah. Okay. That's not right. Yeah, it should be minus 24. Yeah, this is the right, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what I'm using here? I think I was using the uh, exponent for, uh, uh, yeah, no. That's for, it's for kilograms, so we can make this. 24 should do it, right? Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of... Uh, the Boltzmann constant. No, no, no. I was, I'm sorry, guys. It's Monday morning. Uh, just got the wrong one up there. I'm sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so we got... Let's see. Is that about right? 1.99447 times 10 to the minus 23. Okay, so anyway, this is grams per atom. Okay, up here we'll have AMUs per atom. Okay, so we'll take that number. And multiply it by Avogadro's number, because now we want to find out that's the mass of an individual atom. What is the mass per mole? So it's going to be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. Okay, now using this, you can see atoms are going to cancel out. We're going to have grams per mole as an answer. Okay, so uh, let's go through the calculation here. All right. Okay, and we'll times that by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And anybody got an answer there? 12.01. In fact, if we take it out this far, we could say 12.0107, which we could then round off 
do this. If you want to keep it with just four significant fig, well, actually, we got five there, so that's fine. So this is going to come out to grams per mole. <laughs> so if you take any element on the periodic table and take its molar mass in AMUs, which is what's stated up there, okay, and basically convert that into grams per atom using this conversion here, then you'll find the mass for an individual atom. Multiply that by Avogadro's number, and you have the molar mass. And as you can see, it's the exact same number every time you do this. So this gets back to that statement about if you look at the periodic table for the molar masses, you can interpret that as AMUs per atom, or you can interpret it as grams per mole. It's the same number. Okay? Any questions about that? Uh, one second, sir. Yeah. No, I did I get a chance to get over here. Okay. Thank you. I corrected it up there, but I forgot to get over there. But thank you, and the video thanks you. Sir, yeah. No, no, I'm not going to ask you this on an exam at all. I just was explaining the relationship, that's all. What do you mean one more thing? Which part? This? Okay, here's what I'm doing. Okay, if anybody doesn't understand, I don't want to confuse you with an explanation here. So to explain the explanation, I'm just showing you the difference on the periodic table that this can be AMUs per atom. You can also interpret it as grams per mole. But if I just tell you that, then you just accept it and just repeat it. I was showing you why it is. I'm not going to make you do this calculation. I don't care. But I'm hoping by showing you this, you're just not blindly accepting the statement. Okay? Any other questions about this? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just, just taking you through an explanation. I try to teach a comprehensive course. So I'll show you some stuff. I mean, you can sit back if I say it's not going to be on the exam, but I'm hoping it helps your understanding of things. Okay? All right. By the way, I wasn't angry at your thing. I was just trying I was just couldn't figure out what, what needed to be done here. Okay. So we've got that up there. All right. Um, so with this kind of information, right off the periodic table, but not that one because they don't have this information, right here inside of your book or print out those uh, periodic tables. And uh, right at the bottom there, the interpretation is uh, the molar mass of chlorine would be, well, let's just do it this way. Okay, script capital M, interpret that as molar mass. Okay, molar mass. So the molar mass of chlorine, as you can see, is 35.45. And now since we're talking molar mass, we don't even think about using AMUs. You use the AMUs when you're describing the mass, the relative mass of an individual atom, or maybe molecules, okay? Because that's the appropriate units. See, once again, we're getting back to appropriate units. Okay, AMU is appropriate to measure the mass of a very small thing. And then again, as I said, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's a relative mass. However, when you're working in a chemical laboratory, it's totally inappropriate to say, yeah, get me so many AMUs of, okay? Because they don't make uh, scopulas that small. Uh, but you talk about grams per mole, you don't want to pour it in your hand, but it's about a handful of chemicals, let's say. Okay, very, I mean, up to your palm, perhaps. Um, anyway, all that is... What? Oh, the camera. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was watching the video last night, and all of a sudden I'm going like, move the camera, move the camera. Because I had moved it, you know. I'm thinking like, God, it was obnoxious to me, and I gave a lecture, you know. But anyway, uh, but thank you very much. I don't really mind people reminding me about that. As long as you don't throw something when you say it. All right, um, so there's no questions. Or are there any questions about getting the molar mass of an element? Okay, now also keep in mind, if they say, what's the molar mass of uh, uh, elemental chlorine? What would you say? 
Well, what's the formula for elemental chlorine? Cl2. Cl2, right. I want you guys to come back, kind of review that stuff, because we're going to take that information a little bit further now. So anyway, uh, read the formula carefully. If I say the molar mass of CO2, <laughs> well, for anybody who might be kind of rusty here, well, the molar mass of chlorine is going to be, of carbon, is going to be 12.011. Uh, let's just make that four significant figures, grams per mole, okay? And then we're going to have two oxygens. Each oxygen to four significant figures is 16.00. Uh, so that's going to come out to 32.00 grams per mole. Okay, just add these guys up here, and we're going to come out to 44.01, 44.01 grams per mole. Okay, whenever you're uh, c coming up with the molar mass of a compound, always assume it's one mole of that compound to start with. Well, that's what it is, the molar mass. So, uh, in, oh, here's, here's, a, here's a little review question for you. Um, in carbon dioxide, in one mole of carbon dioxide, how many moles of carbon? Yell it out. You didn't yell where you did. One mole, two moles of oxygen equals one mole of carbon dioxide. That might sound like kind of a trivial point, but sometimes students get a little bogged down when you say, well, how many moles of you go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, not saying it's not a matter of intelligence, it's just it's the way we're not used to thinking. <laughs> So anyway, <coughs> excuse me. So are there any problems with how we come up with the molar mass of a compound, of an element, the relationship of grams to AMUs? Nothing? Yes? Well, 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 tell me where to start when you're talking about the molar mass. The very beginning? Or just this? Oh, just this? Well, on the periodic table, if you look at chlorine, it's going to have 35.45 under it. Like I say, this periodic table does not, but please bring your periodic table or at least your textbook to class. Okay? Okay? Now, this, as I told you, can be, if you're talking about an atom of chlorine, uh, the appropriate unit would be, of, of weight would be AMUs, okay? Atomic mass units. All right. Now, I just showed you in this calculation, which I used carbon, but it works for any of the elements. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm good. <coughs> Sorry. Um, you can also interpret that as 35.45 grams per mole. That's why we call it the molar mass, because it's the mass of one mole. Just as when we say the molar mass of CO2, that's the mass of one mole of carbon dioxide. It's 44.01 grams per mole. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Moving right along here, folks. Uh, let's do, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's do another calculation here. And move the camera. Here we go. All right. First of all, let's uh, let's see. Uh, let me, I'm doing carbonate, right? I want you guys to take a second, do the calculation, come up with the molar mass of ammonium carbonate. <laughs> uh, I should have asked you what the name of it was first, but it is ammonium carbonate. So let's just take a minute here. I could do it right on the board, but I think it's a little bit of a calisthenic thing here that you guys can just try it to kind of see how you're doing with working these things. Ammonium carbonate. 
Dr. Goganea, how are you this morning? Good. Okay, let's take a minute and then I'll just go to the board and you, you can review your work as I show you, okay? But right now, I'm serious, do it. See if you know how to do it. <coughs> You're going to need a periodic table. If you don't have one, look at your neighbor's periodic table. Unless you haven't memorized it already, but I don't expect you to do that. Okay, let's start to finish it up. We got things to do here. <coughs> okay, did you get it? You had that confident air about you. Kind of thought you did. You got it? You think so? Don't say it. Just go like this. Cool. Yeah, I got it. Kind of go, of course. It gets right. That's you got to do. Be confident, right? All right, let's take this apart here now. How many nitrogens? There you go. Two nitrogens. Each nitrogen is 14.00. So we'll put this down as 28.00 grams per mole. That's actually a G, if you can believe that. All right, now how many hydrogens? Eight. Eight. Eight hydrogens. Each hydrogen is 1.01. .01. And I don't think we have to do any more of that. Oh, yeah, 1.01. .01. So that's going to be 8.08 .08 grams per mole. <coughs> Let's see, what else we got here? One carbon. I'll give that one to you. Okay, each carbon is going to be 12.01 .01 grams per mole. And then we're going to have three oxygens. So it's three oxygens to four significant figures. I know the periodic table says 15.999, blah, blah, blah. But we're just going to round up to four significant figures to so 16.00, which is going to come out to 48.00 grams per mole. OK? So we add them up here. We're going to have nine down there. Then just the zeros here. That's going to be 10, 18, uh, 26. And that's going to be 448, 96.09. Did I do that too quick? Or not too quick. When I do it too quick, I usually make mistakes. Uh, no, it's good. 96.09 grams per mole. Uh, let's see. And it's on camera, too. That's not bad. There you go. I just have a question about rounding. Yes. If you're taking it out to four significant figures, you would just leave off um, everything after the nine, or would you round to? Uh, beyond uh, the five significant figures, what did you get? 96.0 what? 9.4. Yeah, we round it off like this. You know, we're just going to less than five. We'll do a simple round off, okay? Okay. Well, I actually mean four is, is just the normal thing to drop there. <coughs> I'm not running away, folks. Just want to get an eraser. Here we go. All right, so that is our molar mass. Now, with this in mind, first of all, are there any questions? Do we understand what, was, what just happened here? Are we okay with it? Okay. Yes. Yes. Why Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, let's see. Yeah, I did. 
Okay. Well, it should have been a zero, 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 eight. I think it's come out the same way, though, if you want. Yeah, it'll still run out the same way, but I was just looking at my decimal places. Sorry about that. But, yeah, yeah. 1401? Oh, you know what? Uh, this book has 1401. Usually I just use 1400. So, yeah. <laughs> I was just my choice. Okay. Uh, if I give you a periodic table during, I will give you a periodic table during the exam, uh, but seriously, I usually use 14.00, and I just realized they have 001. Um, I'm going to turn my phone off. Sorry about that. Unless there's a huge emergency in a lab or something. Go. There you go. I know it was rude to them, but what the heck. Yeah, so that was it. I usually use 14.00, that's all. Okay? So... But if I give a periodic table, just go to the, on the periodic table, okay? So there's no ambiguity. <coughs> All right, everybody else okay? I'll get you in a second, yeah. What if we had a negative sign for the CO2? If we had what? Negative sign for the CO2. Yeah, negative, yeah, carbonate is a negative ion. Yeah, but what if we had that? I was going to add one more to all the other calculations, or is this Oh, no, 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 no. No, the charge is something totally different. Okay, we're just talking about the, the masses of the individual, in this case, the individual ions, the ammonium and the carbonate. We're not regarding charges at all at this point. Okay, okay, back there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what your periodic table has. This one has, uh, you know, the thing is, they're all four significant figures, not you brought it. Well, hydrogen, they do have is four, but I was just looking at the decimal places, which I know doesn't really count as the same thing but uh, yeah but yeah just normally four significant figures hydrogen has four significant figures but three decimal places so what can I say and then when you add them up it's going to go back to two uh, decimal places anyway right okay anything else all right let's take this a step further now and talk about percent composition it's a very simple concept if we're looking at this formula <coughs> made up of nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, and I were to say to you, what's the percent oxygen in this compound? Well, you can imagine how to do it. You've got your total mass. When you say percent, also we're talking percent by weight. Okay? So maybe I should put this up, percent composition, just a little parentheses, by weight or by mass. Okay, be a little more exact here. Okay? By mass. Okay, so you can imagine, you got your total mass of the ammonium carbonate. And if I say what's the mass, percent mass of the oxygen, I'll put it on the board, but I think you guys can probably figure it out. Okay, we would have uh, mass of oxygen over mass of, uh, oh, okay, mass of the ammonium carbonate. Okay. And uh, just to kind of clarify this, we'll be saying percent oxygen in ammonium carbonate. Okay? So that's what we're going for here. So we'll just take that, excuse me, please, just for a second, times 100. Okay? Was there a question? Oh, okay. I just heard kind of a, I didn't want to show what it was. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. That's what it sounded like down here. You have to speak, you know, eloquently. Uh, Professor Mundell, Dr. Mundell, excuse me, sir, but the comment needs to be moved a bit over. Sorry to bother you. <laughs> Wouldn't life be lovely? <laughs> okay, camera is moved. Let me move just a little bit more. There you go. All right. <laughs> So we'll take this, and this will give us percent oxygen. I, I should write that out because it looks like percent zero. Okay? There you go. Like that. Okay, so we take this. We've already got the mass of the, the ammonium carbonate, or excuse me, of the oxygen in the ammonium carbonate, so we're, we're pretty good to go here. The ammonium carbonate is going to be 96.0. 
nine, that's gonna be grams per mole. And the uh, total oxygen's gonna be 48 grams per mole. And we'll take this and multiply it by 100. Now the grams per mole, you know, units, we treat them now like they're numbers. Units cancel just like numbers cancel. So the units grams per mole cancel on the numerator and the denominator. <laughs> me. All right, let me get my expensive little calculator out here. And we'll do this. And that's going to be 48.00 uh, divided by 96.09 times 100. And uh, uh, by the way, I'm going to throw this calculator out after class, if you don't mind. Maybe just run over to my car. Hey, it's Monday. I do what I want. 96 point. And it's my birthday. <laughs> so there you go. I come out with 49.95316, which we're going to round off to four significant figures. So we're going to have 49.95 grams, oh, oh, I'm sorry, so what am I saying? Percent, thank you, oxygen. Did you guys get that okay? All right, can I you move on now? Okay, then that's what I will do. Good, we're making pretty good time this morning here. All right, if there are no questions, let's do a quick review here of balancing chemical equations. And for that, let's do this. Let's move that camera, Dr. Mundell. Thank you. That's good enough. Why do we balance chemical equations? Besides, it makes chemistry more unappetizing for people. Why do we have to balance chemical equations? Why do they need to be balanced? What? So they're stable. Stable. That's a nice try. What is that? The amount of products equal the amount of reactants. So there's a conservation of what? Mass. I think we all said that. Mass. Yes. That was frightening. All right. Yes, conservation of mass. That's what they found out back in the days of Lavoisier. A uh, brilliant man, he collected taxes, everybody liked him. Even when, he, even when they gave him money, they liked him. And, uh, <coughs> well, there was, he, was, he was a dedicated, uh, call him like a renaissance man back then. He was like, in his big estate, he was with his wife doing chemical experiments and other things, because that's what you had to do when you were like an aristocrat back then. And then uh, after he did all this nice work, and he discovered by used, doing reactions with mercury that... Um, the mass, total mass of the reactants equals the total mass of the uh, products, okay? So there was a conservation of mass. And the people were so happy, well, they weren't that happy because they, they, they didn't forget about the French Revolution that was going on that time. And he was an aristocratic tax uh, man. And so he went to, uh, call him Madame Guillotine, is that what they used to call it? Yes, he lost his head. So. But he was a brilliant man, and he wasn't a bad man, and, uh, but he made some really great contributions, Lavoisier. Um, but anyway, we carry this thing on now. Uh, so the thing about balancing mass, the way we can interpret it, we don't have to sit there and figure out how many grams of this, how many grams of that. It's a matter of conservation of the atoms, okay? So let's talk about balancing chemical equations. Okay, we do this for conservation of mass. Now, maybe I didn't word that properly. So we do this for conservation of mass. It's not like, like we're like um, conservationists, you know, going out in the wilds to preserve forests and such. <laughs> like we don't patrol these chemical reactions to make sure they're conserving mass. The point is, is that matter can never can neither be created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. Okay. Um, but that's not totally, totally, totally true, is it, Dr. Goganea? 
for the purpose of general chemistry and laboratory work, but the truth of the matter is whenever you have an exothermic reaction, we lose a little mass, don't we? A minuscule amount because the mass is turned into energy. According to that gentleman Einstein, yes, what does he know, right? Um, in an endothermic reaction, we actually increase the mass. And I'm talking about we're going out five, six, seven decimal places or something like that. Maybe not that many, but the idea is that strictly speaking, let's say for laboratory chemistry, mass is conserved. It's neither created nor destroyed. But even a broader interpretation, which I think is probably even better here, is that, <laughs> well, first we can say this, mass is neither created nor destroyed uh, in a chemical reaction. Bless you. Oh. Okay, but the way I think it will help us do this is that, uh, how about this? The atom count in a chemical reaction uh, reaction does not change. The atom count. That's probably a better way to get into <coughs> balancing chemical equations and remembering what's going on. Okay. Time for a cup of coffee. It's in my union contract. I was just kidding. Yeah. All right, so to put this to use, suppose we were to take nitrogen gas and react it with hydrogen gas to come up with ammonia gas. <laughs> OK, what we have to do here is account for all of the atoms. Now we look up here, and on this side here, we have two nitrogens. Okay, we look on this side, we have one nitrogen. Okay, now here's the deal. Uh, just to review a, a particular concept here. <coughs> These subscripts are sacred. Okay, once you put them down, you've identified your chemical compound, you can't change them, okay? We're assuming if I give you nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia, that we can't add extra stuff in there. We gotta work with what's given, okay, that's the whole thing. So we can assume that this is the entire source of nitrogen and this is the uh, entire, let's say, product with nitrogen in it. So we have to explain, like we're not telling the chemical reaction what to do, we're trying to analyze it. We're trying to come to a balanced equation, okay, that works. <clears throat> so we have two nitrogens here. The only way we could, let's say, have two nitrogens over here all right, is that we assume that two molecules of ammonia were formed, because now we have two nitrogens, okay? So like I say, coming to balancing an equation, think of it as you have a description of a chemical reaction. They give it to you in the form of formulas, okay? Call it symbolic language, if you will, okay? And now what we have to do is we have to account for the conservation of mass, the conservation of the atoms, okay? So if we have two nitrogen atoms here, we have to assume that we had two molecules of ammonia formed, okay, I'll erase this here now, and we do this, okay? We do not touch the subscripts, that's sacred stuff, okay? Because if we were to change this at all, we're changing the, the nature of the compound, okay? It's a different reaction. It doesn't really fit this description. <laughs> okay, so two nitrogens, two nitrogens. So we look at the hydrogens. Here we have two hydrogens, and here we have two times three, six hydrogens. Is everybody following this? We okay? Okay. It, believe me, don't be shy. If you have any problems, put your hand up. You owe it to yourself to do that. Okay? All right, so 
how do we change this into six hydrogens? We have to assume that instead of just having one molecule of hydrogen gas reacted, three molecules of hydrogen gas have reacted, okay? Because that's going to give us three times two, six hydrogens, okay? Any questions? Are we okay? All right. Uh, let's do, uh, let's see. Yeah. Let's do one more here. It's kind of a shortcut thing. There are no questions. Let me erase this and put another reaction up here. <laughs> uh, let's see. If you have uh, lead, lead to nitrate, okay, that sounds good to me. And it's going to be aqueous plus potassium iodide aqueous, okay? And it turns out what it's going to go to is lead to iodide. That's going to be a solid plus uh, potassium nitrate. Okay, and the reason I'm choosing this reaction is because now we're throwing around polyatomic ions. Now, yes, in a chemical reaction, like a nitrate could be reduced to a nitrite. You could basically lose an oxygen out of it. But when you inspect this reaction, you see nitrate remains nitrate. So rather than balancing like two nitrogens and six oxygens, just balance the nitrates together. We've got two nitrates here, one nitrate there. See what I'm saying? So look for some shortcuts and just, so that'll give us two nitrates against two nitrates. So we're good there. We got one lead and one lead. So one lead for now is fine. One lead here is fine. And then we've got one iodine, or iodide, excuse me. And over here we have two iodides. In fact, to make it look better, let's put the charge on them, okay? And this is going to be lead plus two, plus two, what the heck? <coughs> okay, so we got to go from one iodide to two iodides, so we have to assume that there are two units of this Ki. So that's also going to give us two potassium ions, and uh, over here we already have two potassium ions. Okay, so just a little thing that can make it go a little faster. Now, chemical equations are like doing a crossword puzzles, you know, like sometimes you can zip through them maybe. I'm not good at them myself, but uh, you can just zip through them pretty quickly. Uh, and sometimes you got to have a big eraser on your pencil and just keep going back and going back and rechecking and balancing them. So, you know, don't get frustrated if you're doing a homework problem or something and all of a sudden you find yourself having to... Hold on, guys. We've got four whole minutes here. Take off your parachutes. Yes, ma'am. What's the state of matter for the last product? I'm sorry? What's the state of matter for the last product? Oh, I'm sorry. Aqueous. Okay, we'll get back to this reaction and the uh, uh, idea of what aqueous means, more detail. But uh, anyway, any questions about balancing equations? Very straightforward stuff. <coughs> um, Monday, it's Monday, so let's leave two minutes early. See you guys on Wednesday. I will tell you guys it should be posted tonight or tomorrow. You'll have two days. Okay. All right, let's stop the record.